Political radicals encourage the acts that lead to the revolution. And 13 divided, ill-prepared colonies reluctantly join forces to battle the most powerful nation on earth. Passion governs, and she never governs wisely. The colonies are not to be emancipated. All men are created to victory or death. It was a war that began in a single bloody day. On the night of April 18th, 1775, a Bostonian of French descent rode hard into the Massachusetts countryside. His name was Paul Revere, and his sturdy hands fashioned some of the finest silver pieces in colonial America. Sometimes he used his metalworking skills to sculpt false teeth. His ride that night was a link in a chain of events that would lead directly to the eight-year war for America's independence. Before the end of that long war, Revere would be court-martialed and finally acquitted for his role in an American naval fiasco. But it was this ride that would make him immortal. Paul Revere was one of several people who had volunteered to be alarm riders. As it turned out, Paul Revere's ride took him in the same direction that the British were going to march. The message Paul Revere and his fellow alarm riders carried was about a column of 700 British troops marching from the port of Boston into the Massachusetts countryside. I rode upon a full gallop from Mystic Road. In Medford, I awakened the captain of the Minutemen and after that, I alarmed almost every house till I got to Lexington. Paul Revere. In Lexington, in this house, Revere found the friends he wished to warn of the British advance. Samuel Adams, a political agitator and propagandist, and John Hancock, the wealthiest man in New England, once described as a young man whose brains were shallow and pockets deep. They were both radicals and targets of the British. But General Thomas Gage, commander of the King's Army in Boston, had more to be concerned about than two radical leaders. He knew that colonists were storing weapons and ammunition in nearby Concord. He saw that they were organizing themselves into independent military units. There was already a military organization in the colonies. It was the colonial militia. But they were beginning to form from the militia these people called the Minutemen, who were one-third of the militia group, the most active, youngest men, ready to move at a moment's notice. The road to Concord ran through Lexington. On the village green, 77 of these Minutemen and militiamen organized in the early morning of April 19th. The militia had no intention of stopping the British at Lexington. They simply lined up uh, along the common in a rather pathetic display of force 
and they were ordered not to fire on the British. Gage had marched troops into the Massachusetts countryside before, looking for arsenals, and he had met colonial militia before. But those meetings had ended bloodlessly, with the British turning around and marching back to Boston. At Lexington, 23-year-old Sylvanus Wood, barely five feet tall, had a view from the militia line. The officer swung his sword and said, Lay down your arms, you damn rebels, or you will all be dead men. Sylvanus Wood. As often occurs in this kind of confrontation, there was a nervousness about the whole operation, and somehow someone fired a shot and started a war. I saw and heard a gun fired, which appeared to be a pistol. Then I could distinguish two guns and then a continual roar of musketry. Paul Revere. There was some dispute about who fired the first shot. Um, it was very natural, the most natural thing in the world for the troops to open fire on armed opponents. At the end of the encounter, eight colonists were dead. Two were wounded. Only one British soldier had received a minor flesh wound. For most of them, as well as the Americans, this was their very first taste of battle. They had just fired on their own British troops. After all, this would be like the United States National Guard standing at Lexington and firing at the regular army that comes close to them. The British marched on to Concord and began to seek out the hidden arsenals. Believing their town was about to be destroyed, the Minutemen and militiamen acted. They moved on the British companies left to hold the bridge over the Concord River. As the rebels marched towards the bridge, the British fired a warning shot. Then they fired into the approaching colonists. The American rebels fired back. British soldiers were killed. The confrontation on Concord Bridge started a 19-mile running battle as nearly 11,000 Minutemen and militiamen from all over the state rushed toward the road from Concord to Boston, the avenue of the British retreat. Over 4,000 of them would reach the road to fire upon the King's army. The real battle took place on the march back to Boston. Uh, and it was a very bloody process with the Americans pouring in shots at this British column from both sides and the British sending out flanking parties into the fields uh, to catch uh, many an unwary American from behind and uh, bayonet him in the back. And then they've had to fight their way through several towns and there was a lot of house-to-house -house fighting. It was really a brawl. Of the musket balls that rained around the Redcoats, only one in 300 found its mark. Ironically, the Americans fired with British-made Brown Bess muskets, which they had been issued as militiamen. The weapon was notoriously inaccurate. We were fired on from all sides, but mostly from the rear. The country was an amazing strong one, full of hills, woods, stone walls, etc., which the rebels did not fail to take advantage of. We watched miles, their numbers increasing from all parts, while ours was reducing by death, wounds, and fatigue. And we were totally surrounded with such an incessant fire as it's impossible to conceive. Lieutenant John Barker. At the end of the day, the British troops reached the safety of the Charlestown Peninsula, just above Boston. Seventy-three of their fellows had been killed. The struggle for America had begun. It would not end before involving all the greatest military powers in the world in a global war. The American Revolution was the most important event in American history. It not only legally created the nation in 1776, but it infused into our culture all of our noblest ideals, our, our highest aspirations, our, our belief in equality, our belief in liberty, our belief in the happiness of ordinary people, 
you know, relief in constitutionalism, all of these things came out of the revolution. These are the things that we still stand for today. We, the strange mix of folks who ended up calling ourselves Americans, we qualify everything that we do and all the relationships that we have domestically and in terms of our foreign policy on those ideals that came out so very clearly as we started into the war of our independence. So many aspects of what Americans are today can be seen here in this revolution. Our tendency to go wildly optimistic about things and go flying off in all directions. We love liberty, but we also love authority. Uh, uh, we fought to free everybody in America, but we still had a lot of slaves, which it took us another 100 years to solve. Our uh, ability to come back from incredible discouragements and finally you know, win the last battle. All these things, all, all these uh, composites of America are here in this revolutionary experience. And it's also a great story. It's a great drama. What do we mean by the revolution? The war? That was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect and consequence of it. The revolution was in the minds of the people. And this was affected from 1760 to 1775 in the course of 15 years before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. John Adams. In the decades before the War of Independence began, the 80% of the American colonists who were white enjoyed standards of freedom and prosperity nearly unequaled anywhere else on earth. The riches of a vast, untamed continent were theirs for the taking. We can't look at America today and even begin to imagine what it was like then. First of all, there were only two and a half million people spread all the way from Maine to Florida, and they were all close to the ocean. There were four cities that had a population of over 10,000. The rivers themselves were obstacles to movement on the land. There was no bridge across any major river. The rivers were highways leading from the ocean inland, but obstacles to movement if you wanted to go from one colony to another colony. It was wooded. A squirrel could have traveled to every acre in the 13 colonies and have never touched ground, just going from tree to tree to tree. The colonists saw themselves as the freest people in the world, living in the kind of society envisioned by 18th century philosophers. The land was cheap, it was available, society was fluid, uh, the social ladder was short, but it was shaky too. Wealth was accessible through hard work and perseverance. And wealth was the key to movement up that social ladder. For over three decades, beginning in 1732, a self-made Philadelphia printer and writer named Benjamin Franklin reflected that colonial attitude in his popular magazine, Poor Richard's Almanac. Industry pays debts, while despair increases them. God helps those that help themselves. There are no gains without pains. Ben Franklin. Theirs was the age of enlightenment. And the ideas of great minds, guided by reason, dominated thought in Europe. Nearly 70% of the colonists were English, or of English descent. And they looked to England, the strongest nation on earth, for cultural, social, and political direction. A 
the temper and character which prevail in our colonies are, I am afraid, unalterable by any human art. An Englishman is the unfittest person on earth to argue another Englishman into slavery. Edmund Burke, English statesman. Yet true slavery was an undeniable fact of colonial life. Although concentrated in the South, where the principal crop was labor-intensive tobacco, slavery was practiced throughout the colonies, and slaves were a part of the shipping industry that dominated New England. Ships would take rum from Massachusetts to London. They would drop down to Africa, pick up slaves, and take them across to the West Indies, where they dumped the slaves they picked up molasses and brought that molasses up to New England, where it would be used to distill rum. They then picked up rum and the cycle started again. By 1750, Massachusetts exported more than two million gallons of rum a year. But rum wasn't the only Massachusetts export influenced by slavery. This is good old Boston, the home of the bean and the cod. The bean was the Boston bean which was grown to feed the slaves in the West Indies. And the Boston merchants are heavily involved in exporting beans, dried fish, timber, all sorts of things which the West Indies need for their survival. To their west, the colonists found a howling frontier a place of constant conflict with America's first possessors, the Indians. And in 1754, two decades before the start of the American Revolution, that frontier became the battleground for a full-scale conflict known as the French and Indian War. In the mid-1700s, the rich and wild Ohio River country became an area of disputes between the French, who were the possessors of Canada, the British, who were the possessors of colonies along the East Coast, and Native American groups. One of the reasons why the colonists, uh, the American colonists, clung to the British during most of the time that they were here in North America was this fear of uh, French encroachment uh, with the help of the Indians. The British sent an eager but untried strapping 21-year-old major from Virginia into the central Pennsylvania wilderness in 1754 to tell the French that they were invading British lands. His name was George Washington and his regiment along with a group of British sympathizing Indians led by a warrior named Half King, fired the shots that led to the outbreak of war. I heard the bullets whistle, and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. George Washington, 1754. The Virginians discharge a volley or two, rush into the camp, the French, those who were not wounded or killed instantly, try to run out of the camp. But Half King and his warriors are on the back side of the camp. So everyone is captured or killed except for one or two soldiers who make it back to spread the word. Jumanvi, the commander, is initially captured and would have been kept hostage or in interrogated. However, at this point, the Half King strode up to Jumanvi and probably with a, a club very similar to this, struck him down right in front of Washington, and that was it. Weeks later, the French and their Indian allies forced Washington surrender at his hastily constructed fort. But unbeknownst to him, the surrender document written in French accused him of assassinating a French diplomat, namely, Jumanville. He signed the document. So George then became catapulted onto the international scene as a character who had uh, wantonly shot down this poor innocent Frenchman who was, uh, of course, nothing of the sort.
the causes of the war, of course, were uh, much more profound. Uh, the uh, British had decided that uh, they were just not going to put up with the French in Canada. The alleged assassination of Jumonville was the match that ignited a war that would continue for five years in America, seven years on the world stage. The war finally turned in favor of the British at a 1759 battle for the fortress city of Quebec, located strategically on high cliffs above the wide St. Lawrence River. Whoever controlled Quebec controlled the St. Lawrence, and whoever controlled the St. Lawrence controlled the interior of Canada. Here, nearly 5,000 British met over 4,000 French soldiers. British General James Wolfe lost his life, but won the battle. Canada became a British possession, and France all but withdrew from North America. Once this threat to their well-being was removed, then the colonists began to think, well, do we really need to be run by this pipsqueak island off the coast of Europe? Uh, they began to see themselves as the true possessors of this vast continent. And the seeds of the American Revolution were sown in this uh, rout of the French. But the British saw it another way. They had fought a war defending the American colonies that had left the British Treasury with a crushing debt. The colonies would have to pay their fair share. The Americans had plenty of money and they paid practically no taxes. British taxes on America cost the average American $1.20 a year. And most of these were invisible taxes paid on imports. The British had a, a, a national debt of over 150 million pounds. And there was constant talk in London about the whole country going bankrupt. Their taxes were 25 times higher than the Americans. So they were not particularly uh, impressed when the Americans screamed uh, that you can't tax us. With a population of over 20,000 in the 1760s, the thriving New England port of Boston was, after Philadelphia, the second largest city in America. Here, political radicals known as Whigs or Patriots first felt the burden of British taxation and resisted it. As early as 1760, a Boston lawyer and political theorist named James Otis saw the seeds of tyranny in arbitrarily imposed taxes. There is a man who is forgotten, and he's more important than any of them, at least as far as the way that the revolution started, and that's James Otis. It was his writings which were the inspiration for Sam Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, and indeed all the others. Otis was the mind behind it. That Sam Adams was the mouth. Samuel Adams was a radical by nature. He saw tyranny coming through the windows in all directions. And he really became the closest thing we had to a professional revolutionary. He did nothing really much else to support himself in Boston except agitate. Early taxes like the Sugar Act affected only wealthy shippers and distillers. But in 1765, the Stamp Act affected everyone by mandating that a stamp purchased from the British government be embossed on all legal documents and newspapers. Sam Adams used the growing opposition to Britain's new laws to organize a political action group named the Sons of Liberty. In Boston and throughout the colonies, the Tories, or Loyalists, saw things differently than Sam Adams and his Patriot companions. They often wanted their relationship with England to change too, but they wanted peaceful change. And above all, they wanted to remain within the confines of the British Empire. John Adams divided the population up into thirds. He said a third were for the revolution, a third were opposed, a third were neutral. 
the Loyalists thought people like Samuel Adams, the Sons of Liberty, were demagogues who were ambitious people who wanted to make it to the top of the political or the economic ladder, who had self-interested motives, and who were very cunning. They often use the word, a variation of the word cunning, to describe the patriot leaders. For loyalists like Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson, whose three-story home was destroyed by patriots in 1765, the Sons of Liberty weren't noble idealists. They were a mob. They call me a brainless Tory. But tell me, which is better? To be ruled by one tyrant 3,000 miles away, or by 3,000 tyrants not a mile away? Mather Barnes, Boston Wales. One common way of dealing with loyalists was to put hot tar on their bodies and um, put chicken feathers on top of the hot tar and to take the person and cart up and down Main Street so that everybody in the community could show their disdain for these people. Britain, secure in her mind, refused to be intimidated by her upstart colonists. She would tax as she pleased, and her colonies would behave and pay. The colonies are not to be emancipated from their dependence on the supremacy of England. George the Third. George III was certainly not a tyrant. He was devoted to the Constitution as the British knew it, to a constitutional monarchy, parliamentary monarchy. The Americans were challenging the British Constitution, which was, in British eyes, the only constitution in the world, the only parliamentary constitution, the only constitution of free men. The king relied on his ministers, especially his prime minister, Lord Frederick North. Upon my word, if we are to run after America in search of reconciliation, I do not know a single act of parliament that will remain. Lord Frederick North. To protect their tax collectors and government officials from mobs like the Sons of Liberty, Britain began to quarter permanent troops in Boston. Their presence led to the events sensationalized in this engraving by Paul Revere. His friend Sam Adams fully exploited the event in his propagandistic writings, referring to it as the Boston Massacre. It was a cold March night in 1770. A lone British sentry held his post on King Street. Bands of citizens were on the streets, angry after a minor confrontation with another soldier earlier in the day. A mob began to form, the sentry the target of their anger. Nearby, Captain Thomas Preston marched his guards to the sentry's side. The mob began to throw snowballs, chunks of ice at the British soldiers. One fell, and his musket fired in the air. Preston shouted to his men to hold their fire, but he was too late. His frightened, angry men fired into the crowd. Five citizens died including Crispus Attucks, a former slave. Sam Adams demanded that the soldiers be tried for murder and that all British troops be removed from Boston. Governor Hutchinson, fearing rioting, ordered the troops removed from the city proper. Later in the year, the soldiers from the massacre were tried. They were defended by three men, including one of the finest lawyers in Boston, a patriot, Sam Adams' cousin, John Adams. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. John Adams at the Massacre Trials.
all but two of the soldiers were acquitted. Those two were court-martialed and then dismissed from the service. With his Boston Massacre hysteria defused, Sam Adams would have to wait for over three years until December of 1773 to engineer a truly decisive protest over attacks on British monopolized tea. Colonists, dressed as Mohawk Indians, boarded tea-laden merchant ships, threw 23,000 pounds of tea into Boston Harbor, and then burned several of the vessels. The tax on tea was three pence a pound, and that meant the average man would have to drink a gallon of tea a day to pay a one dollar tax at the end of the year. So you really couldn't say that this was a cause for revolution. The sense that the British were slowly trying to take control of the American colonies, that is the essence of the perturbed state of the American mind in the 1770s. After the Boston Tea Party, Britain struck back hard with a series of acts known in the colonies as the Intolerable Acts. The first of the acts closed Boston Harbor. The number of British troops there swelled to 3,000. The Patriot propagandists' ravings about repression and economic ruin had become reality. In Williamsburg, Virginia, at a 1765 session of the House of Burgesses, radical Patrick Henry proclaimed in a fiery speech that taxation without representation is tyranny. One of the few things we remember about the American Revolution is no taxation without representation. Benjamin Franklin, when he went to England to act as more or less the unofficial representative for several colonies, he wound up really speaking for all of them. He was told by the people he was representing, under no circumstances should he ever accept a deal for representation in the British Parliament. The last thing they wanted was to be represented in the British Parliament because they knew that they would be totally outvoted. No taxation without representation was strictly a slogan. It was much more than simply taxation without representation. It was a war of ideas. The concept of independence was late in coming, but as the war opened and developed, the whole concept of personal and national liberty took control and was essentially the driving force. The Revolutionary War was not only a war between Britain and her American colonies, it was a civil war. Families were torn apart. There was a huge portion of the population that remained loyal to the king and to England throughout the war. Particularly in the American South, family against family and brother against brother just as fierce in its uh, reality as the American Civil War of later years. One of the families the war would split apart was that of Benjamin Franklin, the self-taught genius who was one of the leading scientists, inventors, writers, and diplomats of his century. The relationship he would lose to the irresistible tide of war was that with his illegitimate son, William. William was with his father when the kite experiment was performed. He was not the little boy that's generally depicted. He was in his early 20s, but he certainly was there, and he took a great interest in all of his father's experiments. A friend remarked that they were more like brothers than father and son. They were very, very close. He has good principles and good dispositions and I think is not deficient in good understanding Ben Franklin on William 1762 
Franklin spent nearly 15 years before the revolution in England, serving as a lobbyist, first for Pennsylvania, then for Georgia and Massachusetts as well. It was there that his relationship with his son and with England began to deteriorate. Going to England was always called going home in those days. He admired the king. He said good things about the king. So he had been very loyal, and the disappointment came bit by bit. It was started, I think, with the Stamp Act. Franklin thought that England was really suffocating the colonies, that the economic laws imposed by London were too stringent. Little by little, his disenchantment grew in the conviction that nothing short of a break would do. It was for him like the end of a love affair. Every man in England seems to consider himself as a piece of a sovereign over America. Seems to jostle himself into the throne with the king and talks of our subjects in the colonies. Benjamin Franklin, 1767. At the same time Ben Franklin began embracing the Patriot position, his son William was hardening into a staunch loyalist. William had been made royal governor of New Jersey, a position many felt he received because of his father's influence. The crown had given him respectability. You must always keep in mind that it was hard for him to be illegitimate. I believe no governor was ever more affectionately received by all ranks of people. Even with those for whom I might have expected opposition, I am on very good terms. William Franklin Ben Franklin's irrevocable split with England came in 1774, when he was humiliated before Britain's Privy Council after leaking documents that supposedly revealed Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson as the instigator of Britain's tax policies in America. I hope, my lords, you will mark and brand this man for the honor of this country, of Europe, and of mankind. He has forfeited all the respect of societies and of men. Alexander Wedderburn at the Privy Council. From then on, his effectiveness in England was pretty much ended as a lobbyist. In fact, when Franklin left England on the eve of the Battle of Lexington, it was to avoid arrest. Had he stayed, he would have been arrested and thrown in jail. Benjamin Franklin sailed home to join the two million Americans whose lives would be permanently changed by the coming war. By the war's end, he would be the most famous man in the world, but would also be forever alienated from his once beloved son. I cannot but lament the impending calamities Britain and her colonies are about to suffer from great imprudencies on both sides. Passion governs, and she never governs wisely. Anxiety begins to disturb my rest. Benjamin Franklin, February 5th, 1775. While Franklin was at sea, Crossing from England to his home in Philadelphia, American and British soldiers fired the first shots of the revolution at Lexington and Concord. In the following weeks, a stalemate ensued as a de facto colonial army encircled the British, who occupied the Boston Peninsula and its harbor. In late May of 1775, less than two months after the fight on Concord Bridge, 
reinforcements arrived from Britain, including General William Howe, who had fought beside the Americans in the French and Indian War. Pompous yet competent General Henry Clinton, also a veteran of the French and Indian War. And General Johnny Burgoyne, gambler, dramatist, and bon vivant. All three would play important roles in the coming years of war. Some of the soldiers thought that one big battle would settle it all. It would enable the Americans to win such a resounding victory that the British maybe would say, oh, we can't possibly defeat these people, they're just too tough, and we'll sue for peace. A leading advocate of a military rather than diplomatic solution was Connecticut's Israel Putnam, a scarred old Indian fighter, another veteran of the French and Indian War. He was a tremendously pugnacious soldier and a very professional soldier, very good soldier. He was the Patton of his day, the ideal combat guy. He had decided that the perfect thing to do to trigger this one big battle was to build a fort on this Charlestown Peninsula that stuck out on one side of Boston with some water in between it. And a fort there with some cannon in it could shell every British ship on the harbor. On the night of June 16th, 1775, the Americans began to fortify Breed's Hill on the Charlestown Peninsula, lower but closer to the water than nearby Bunker Hill. In the morning, the Redcoats were amazed to see an earthworks fort threatening their ships. The British generals ordered two-thirds of their troops in Boston into flatboats and transported them to the Charlestown Peninsula. As the rebels watched and waited atop Breed's Hill, a ball from a British cannon decapitated a young colonist. Some threw down their arms and fled, but nearly 1,200 remained. There is where Putnam got off his great line, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes, which was very good advice for people firing an American musket, because it couldn't hit anything unless you could see the whites of the guy's eyes. An additional fact may also have prompted Putnam's command. Powder was extremely short. Most of the rebels had reached Breed's Hill with less than 13 rounds each. Our troops advanced with great confidence, expecting an easy victory. As we approached, an incessant stream of fire poured from the rebel lines. It seemed a continued sheet of fire for near 30 minutes. Most of our grenadiers and light infantry, the moment of presenting themselves, lost three quarters and many nine tenths of their men. Some had only eight and nine men, a company left. Some only Three, four, and five. British officer at Breed Hill. The British were turned back, but they regrouped and marched again on Breed's Hill. The main thing any soldier would see in a Revolutionary War battle is smoke. Because once all these muskets and, and artillery started shooting, the battlefield was covered with a thick white smoke. It wouldn't be a the typical romantic 18th century painting where everybody's standing heroic in isolated groups fighting other little isolated groups. The uniforms were designed with a stock around the neck to keep the soldier's head up and make it hard to look left and right. They didn't want the soldier to think about what was going on. It was just better if he was an automaton that followed orders. The British retreated a second time from Breed's Hill, but late in the day, General Howe ordered a third assault. The whole American supply system was so primitive that it collapsed, and the Americans ran out of powder, and the British bulldogs that they were regrouped and came on for a third try after being beaten back twice, and the Americans with no powder just had to take to their heels. The British won control of Breed's Hill, Bunker Hill and the entire Charlestown Peninsula, but at a tremendous physical and psychological cost. Nearly half of their 2,200-man landing force had been killed or wounded. 
Battle of Bunker Hill was uh, a terrible eye-opener for the British generals. If you went on fighting battles like that with uh, the small force of British troops in America and the very limited reinforcements that the uh, British were capable of raising and sending in, you'd soon destroy your army. I freely confess to you, when I look to the consequences of it, in the loss of so many brave officers, I do it with horror. The success is too dearly bought. General William Howe. Putnam and his comrades were wrong about one big battle ending the fighting. After the bloodshed on Breed's Hill, both sides now came to the conclusion that a full-scale war was inevitable.